Hello, everybody. Welcome to Revive Health's Daily Briefing Live for Thursday, May 21st, 2020. This is our 30-minute review of the latest, most important news, resources, and advice for health system marketers and communicators who are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. I'm Chris Bevelo, Health Systems Practice Lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I am joined by Chase Kleckner, who is Senior Marketing Manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hey, Chris. Good to see you as always. Good to see you too. And also good to see Jarrett Lewis back. Uh, Jarrett is a partner at Public Opinion Strategies, a national survey research firm based in Alexandria, Virginia. He is focused specifically in the healthcare industry and prior to joining Public Opinion Strategies, he spent nearly a decade at the Health Management Academy, most recently running the health policy practice, and before that, running the firm's internal consumer research division. Hey, Jarek. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming back. We really uh, had great feedback from the last time you were on the show, so glad you could be back with us. So as with each show, we're going to be covering the latest news on COVID-19 and how it relates to marketing communications in the hospital and health system space. Uh, we're going to be hearing a lot from Jarrett on research that they've done. So that'll be the main focus for today. We also want to make this interactive as much as possible. So if you have a question as we go along for Jarrett or myself or Chase, just go ahead and put that in the Q&A queue in Zoom. Uh, and we will try to get to as many of those questions at the end of the show as we can. You can also use the chat function in Zoom uh, to talk to other attendees. Uh, Chase will be using that to post links to things that we're talking about as we move forward. But remember, if you've got a question for us, make sure it ends up in the Q&A queue so we see that. Also remember that you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You can search for it at uh, Revive Health Daily Briefing Live. That'll bring you to it. Uh, as always, we post a video recording of this episode by the end of today. That will be at our website, uh, and specifically on our communications hub, which is at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. Uh, we also have other content there, uh, which we'll touch on in just a second. Uh, so make sure that you uh, visit that. Uh, remember also a couple notes we always throw out there. We are not experts on COVID-19. So this is not a place to come for medical or scientific advice. Uh, we do have advice and thoughts on marketing communications, as you know, as you will hear. Uh, just remember to keep all of it in the context of your own situation, because obviously this crisis is impacting every organization and every community uh, differently as we move through it. So with that, let's uh, cover the news. We're really going to cover one thing today so we can max our time with Jarrett, and that is what we always cover, and that is a case count. And we do that, uh, both case and death count so that we can just keep an overall perspective on where we're at with this crisis, because that obviously influences what we're talking about and how we, we talk about it. So we use the Johns Hopkins tool. Uh, and when I refresh it at the top of the show, globally, we are at uh, 4,858,850 confirmed cases, and we are at 329,300 deaths globally. If we look at that uh, for our own nation, we're at 1,556,749 confirmed cases. And we are now at 93,606 confirmed deaths from COVID. Uh, one of the things we've been kind of talking about recently, uh, but haven't really been um, talking about with specific data. So I wanted to try to call that up if I can find it real quick. Of course, I'm not going to be able to, um, is where we're at with the death count. Um, actually, I did find it. And a great place to find that is at the New York Times hub. And so as we look at the average at the, at the <coughs> excuse me, at the peak nationally, we were around 2,300, um, 2,600. Let's see. I think we've been as high as 2,700. Uh, but we're, we're going further, further down. So yesterday, for example, we saw 1,400 deaths uh, in the country. Uh, that's compared to last week, we we're at 1,700. So hopefully that continues to go down. That's probably a better metric of where we're at because we know with cases, 
Um, just because cases are going up doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Uh, that potentially means we're just testing uh, on a broader basis, which is actually a good thing. So uh, we, we, we tend to look at hospitalizations uh, in terms of like ICU hospitalizations and deaths uh, as a real marker of, of where we're at. So hopefully we continue to see that go down. Um, but obviously as we reopen the country, that's something everybody's keeping an eye on. So with that, one last thing, Jarrett, before we dive in with you, uh, again, that communications hub I mentioned, it's got the recordings of these shows. It has uh, content from our biweekly newsletters on COVID-19 related to hospital and health system marketing communications. It has a lot of our, <coughs> excuse me, research reports. And as we mentioned, we have a new one coming out soon. Uh, and also a lot of information on rapid recovery, which is the effort hospital and health systems are going through uh, across the country to try to get back to um, where they were before in terms of capacity, volumes, uh, and the critical need for that given the financial hole uh, that they were all put in because of turning off elective procedures during the COVID crisis. So find all kinds of stuff there. All right, Jared, are you ready to dive in? Let's do it. All right. So as always, you have all kinds of great things that you can bring to the table. Uh, let's start broadly uh, and maybe just kind of catch us up on some key things that you're seeing in terms of where Americans are at just overall with attitudes and opinions on COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And I'll just give a little bit of context. So really since uh, March 11th, which you may recall was kind of the inflection point as for the attitudes changing, which that was the day that the president gave the Oval Office speech, um, uh, the NBA shut down that night and uh, Tom Hanks announced uh, he had coronavirus. Uh, all those three things happened, I think within the span of a couple hours. And that was the moment where you really started to see opinions change in the United States, at least. We started seeing some early kind of movement before that based on what was happening in China and in Europe, but it really, that was the moment at which we really saw sort of an escalation of attitudes change. And since then, our, we've looked at, we've had, we've talked to over 65,000 people uh, in our own, you know, client-based research. Um, not, all, not all of that is, was specifically around coronavirus, but what we learned early on in all of our research, whether it's my partners who work in the political space or my partners or our work in, you know, energy or other industries was that we had to have questions about COVID-19 uh, in all of our survey research, that people were almost offended if you did not ask them about this thing that has, you know, kind of halted our society. Um, and so we have, you know, thousands and thousands of data points from, you know, statewide to nationally to, you know, citywide around the country. And then we've been looking at, and I've been kind of putting together summaries on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis of, of national publicly available data. So I've looked at a lot of data and I would tell you where, where we are, a couple things um, in terms of sort of overall picture, you know, fear of infection is still around 70% of Americans. It's, it's come down from its peak, which was in really early to mid-April. Um, and people are sort of gradually becoming used to this thing that is going to be with us for a while until there is a vaccine. Um, and I think there's an, a, a increasing recognition about the realistic timeline for a vaccine. Now, realistic timeline is for a lot of people is 2021 or 2022 yeah. which is still much shorter than tip. I think the fastest is, is four years with mumps. And typically I think it's a 12 year, you know, timeline for, for a vaccine to come to, to, to market. So I think, you know, the idea that we're going to have something this fall, I think a lot of people have moved away from that. And so people are learning to live with it. Um, still, the, most of the country is still supportive of shelter in place. Um, you know, you, you see kind of things on the news about people wanting, you know, wanting to reopen. And there is a chunk of people and it is growing that are ready to, to sort of get back to life and reopen. But the majority of the country is still supportive of shelter in place, quarantine, you know, social distancing. Yeah. People understand that, that social distancing works. Uh, there's a Gallup survey point that, that came out uh, last week that three quarter or 80% of the country believes that social distancing actually saves lives. So um, if people I think have learned to live with this, um, you know, at least over the last eight weeks now where we go from here, a lot remains to be seen. Um, but that's sort of, uh, and then, sorry, the, the final point I'll make is, is the economic impact. I think, um, you know, it's interesting when you look back to the last time we had a financial crisis, which was obviously 2008, 2009, there was a lot more pessimism back then. There's still a lot of optimism from folks who have 
unfortunately been furloughed or, or, or even laid off um, that, you know, we're going to bounce back and they're going to be able to get their old job back. And hopefully that is the case for, for those folks. There's, there's more optimism, even though we have these bad economic numbers, and I think we're up to 39 million uh, folks who have filed for uninsured, yeah. uninsurance, uh, uninsured insurance or the insurance uh, for insured as of this morning. Um, but there seems to be a lot more optimism amongst those folks than, than we saw a decade ago. So, so let me ask you about a couple of things. Um, one of the things I'd love for you to either verify if you, if you can from the day you've seen, or if it's not, if not unverify or whatever, de-verify, whatever the, the opposite of verify is. <laughs> um, so one of the things we've been, we've been doing, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but we've done our own research. And obviously like many people, we've, we've seen a high level of stated fears for coming back to the hospital. And most of that was at a national basis, but we started to do market-based versions of it for clients that were interested in how different is it for, I'm in XYZ city, is it the same as what we're seeing nationally? And for the most part, what we've seen is that um, it lines up even in places where the the crisis hasn't been nearly as acute, so not an outbreak or a hotspot, um, there's still levels of fear. Um, But what was interesting to us is um, you know, we did it, the last national survey did was on the 22nd of April. And just to give one example, this was a, uh, a market in Ohio, I won't say which one. Uh, and we ran the same survey and we looked at it in, let's say early May, the first week of May. And again, the numbers kind of lined up with what we saw nationally. We looked at that, that localized um, survey just this week. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's two weeks later and the numbers had actually gotten worse. And what I mean by worse is the level of fear had actually ticked up. Um, And that's not intuitive what we think, because I think with the data you shared is what we would expect in terms of fear of getting COVID overall, as we see the cases decline and the deaths decline. And as we move through it, hopefully people would have that. Um, But what we're taking away from it is either we don't have enough data to know this definitively or the reason why the fear of going back into the hospital is maybe taking a little back back up is because people are recognizing, as you've said, that this is a longer term thing. This isn't going away completely. We're going to be dealing with with COVID relate, related precautions in our healthcare systems like social distancing and waiting rooms, like cleanliness, like wearing a mask for a longer period. And so as that discussion has um, happened over particularly in the last few weeks as we've reopened, people are starting to go, okay, so now I do need to be a little more concerned about um, going to the hospital. I, it's hard to say whether what we're seeing is really a trend a little bit up for that specific data or not, but I wonder if you've seen anything like that or if that makes sense intuitively to you. It does. And I think there's a couple things at play. I think one, you know, it's interesting. You think, if you think about the way that we have talked about you know, uh, sites of care, hospitals predominantly around the country over the last eight weeks. I mean, you've, you've heard terms like war zone uh, mm-hmm. described and you've seen the images and, and folks have seen the images on CNN or Fox News or however they, they consume their information, which I know we're going to talk about uh, as, you know, sort of a lot of New York centric uh, or Detroit centric places mm-hmm. that have been really, really badly hit or New Orleans that have been really badly hit. And so I think that has kind of put this thought into folks about kind of the, the you know, the, it's created some fear amongst going into or about going into a, a medical facility, per, particularly a hospital. I think the other thing that's that's sort of been interesting that we've seen as we have gone further and further and measured attitudes into this, you know, people are really bad predictors at future behavior. Polls are meant to be snapshot in a given time, not predictive. People do horrible jobs at, and so why we, you know, New Year's resolutions, we, we almost all fail you know, as a society, when we set out our New Year's resolutions, we're really bad at predicting future behavior. And so what's been interesting for us to track, as opposed to what people say they're going to do, it's been more the length at which they say they're comfortable returning to pre-COVID life. Yeah. And when we were in mid-March to, you know, early April, that that was sort of, you know, this is going to be short-lived and I'll be ready to bounce back or, or go, you know, engage in those activities, you know, within two to four weeks. As we've gone through week by week, month by month now, the length of time at which people say that they're comfortable, they will, they will be comfortable to do something has lengthened. It has stretched out longer. And I think part of what it is, is if, when you don't do something for a long 
point period of time, you know, if you don't, if you haven't gone out to dinner in two and a half months or three months, the first time you go to do that, you, you're thinking, huh, you know, I, it's not a normal kind of every Saturday night, you know, you go out to dinner with your spouse or your family or whatever. You start thinking more about it, about actually the activity in itself that you didn't think about before. And I think the same thing applies to hospitals, whereas, you know, three months or four months, you know, ago, or outpatient centers, or even primary care centers, I think people didn't think about going in to see their primary care physician or going to have an elective procedure or going into the ED if something was wrong. Now it's sort of like, huh, I, you know, I hadn't, you haven't done it in a long time. And now you start to think about all those things, like what you're seeing on TV or what you're hearing, and also just sort of common sense and knowledge about where are the where's the likeliest place that there's going to be COVID patients. And so that's all those things I think factor into yeah. what people are thinking. And I think that what you said about the market that you guys saw that sort of uptick, it doesn't surprise me because I think it's consistent with the things that we're seeing in, in what we're looking at. So there's, there was a great story yesterday that's, that speaks to this. Um, Charlie Warsaw, I don't know if, if you're familiar with him. He's one of my favorite um, reporters and he's, he's, He's kind of, he talks mainly about the, the collision of technology and society. Uh, he's with the New York Times now, and he's had some great pieces during this. And the one yesterday was about, he, he's in Montana, which is a state that's been, I don't know where it's at, but it's got to be like in the bottom five in terms of impact of COVID with deaths and cases for all kinds of reasons. And he's there. And so he was going to go back because it's now possible to eat uh, at a restaurant as just part of like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story of what it's like to go back. Cause it's been however many weeks for him um, with all the restrictions, right? It's, it's 50% capacity. It's social distancing. It's you got to wear a mask though. He found out you didn't. And the story is essentially he, he bailed. He had the reservation. He, this is a, a piece he's doing for the New York times mm -hmm. and he's getting ready to go. And then just to your point, he starts thinking through not just like high level kind of theoretical, but, but wait a second, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to wear a mask because he called the place and the place was like, you can wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask. Like it wasn't required, but he was, he was hoping for more guidance. He's like, so if I wear a mask, I got to take it off to eat. Doesn't that defeat the purpose of wearing a mask? And is it really any, and he just, he leads you through in the story, the, the, the behavior to your point, the actual things that are going to happen and those prevented him from actually going to do something that um, wasn't just a whim, mm -hmm. wasn't just a, I want to get back and eat again. It was a, it was his job, and he still didn't do it. And so, I think you know, I, Chase post the link. I encourage people to read it, but I think it goes right to what you're saying, that you know, once folks actually get to the point where they're going to take action, um, that's where a lot of this, you know, really comes to the forefront. And, and there are really three. I, we're, we're thinking about it as this is maybe an oversimplification. It's, it's more stratified than this, but the way that I've, you know, we've been thinking about it is there are kind of three buckets of people, right? You know, and, and, and it really depends on, you know, a couple things, geography, it depends on population density, and it really depends on, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit, is, is partisanship, uh, which is, you know, kind of um, interesting in a global pandemic that partisanship plays a role, but it, that's sort right. of the, the case with all things in society. But there's sort of three kind of categories of people. There's the folks who are ready to reopen and get back to life right now. There's sort of, I, I'd say the, the middle, which are sort of wait and see what the, maybe the first, what happens with the first, you know, reopenings right. and case counts and are they rising, are they dropping? And, you know, they'll, they'll kind of follow suit. And then there's a third category, which is um, kind of wait till a vaccine basically, or at least a very, very long period of time. And they're going to be hesitant to re-engage in a lot of things, whether it's going to dinner, whether it's going to, you know, a social gathering at someone's house, whether it's going to have an elective procedure. And I'd, I'd say the way that it maybe breaks out is maybe 25, 50 and 25. I think the, yeah. there's a, the, the biggest chunk of the U.S. population is really in that 50 that's sort of ready to resume life, but they're, they're not necessarily they don't want to be the first ones out the door to go to a game, to dinner, to fly, to, you know, take an Uber. Um, they're kind of waiting to see how it goes with other people. Um, yeah. And so they're, they're sort of, those are the three kind of categories, I think, of, of people as a whole around the country. Now that dip, that differs depending on market, region, state, you know, sure. but that's sort of the way we've been, we've been thinking about it. 
So let's let's just jump to the to what you briefly mentioned because this has been coming up. Um, I don't know. I guess we could have anticipated it sooner, but I would say over the last week, for sure, this has started popping up in our conversations with health system clients, and that is the partisan divide in terms of, or in some cases, perceived partisan divide. Because you said this earlier, I saw a survey yesterday that said nearly seventy percent of people in the country believe that you should wear a mask and understood why you would need to wear a mask, which is not really fitting with uh, what you're hearing, right? right? You, you would think it's like 50-50 right. um, because there's a minority that you're hearing much more about because they're more vocal. Um, but undoubtedly, there are different ways that people are looking at this from what does it mean to wear a mask to how quickly do I want to open my business to is this death count accurate, right? Um, so talk a little bit about that, what you guys are seeing and, and the potential implications of that. You know, it's really interesting when you go back to early March and this this was when, you know, this was kind of a little bit before that, the date, the, the March 11th that I mentioned, but it, pollsters started to ask about, you know, the risk of COVID and, you know, sort of the early days of this, the first couple of weeks. And there was a big part, there was a pretty big partisan gap where, Republicans uh, in particular were, were much less likely to believe that there was a, a serious risk or that this would have a serious impact on society. And then what you saw the second half of March into early April was sort of an equaling where everyone sort of was on the same page. Everyone sort of saw things the same, a little bit of difference, but not, not big in terms of the risk, in terms of willingness to abide by you know, the, the measures from governors, regardless of state or party. Um, willingness to, to do the things that, you know, we, we did or have or continue to do. And then in the last probably three weeks or so, you, as states have begun to open up and, and are going back to early May, you've seen that, that partisan gap start to widen and really, really widen. And now it sort of gets to the trend that we had been seeing, um, you know, the last you know, decade or two of people kind of choosing their own news. And I think this has only exacerbated that and accelerated the trend of how people consume information. And it's a, it's a completely different country. When you look at how people consume information uh, and, and, and you know, kind of fact-based things, um, it's, a, it's very interesting to see the differences. And what it's done is it's, it's created this sort of um, beyond the reopening and, and desire to reopen, it's, it started to get into things that you might not think would be questioned like there's a couple of points I'll, examples i'll give you one um there's been the gallup's been tracking uh i think it's gallup uh, has been tracking um if, if people if americans feel that hospitals have what they need to treat covid patients and the number has you know it was in the 60 percent you know a couple of weeks ago that or maybe a month or so ago of people who didn't think that hospitals had what they they needed and that's come down but there there's probably a 30 to 35 point difference between Republicans and Democrats, where Republicans are much more likely to believe the hospitals have the things they need in order to treat, manage COVID patients, and Democrats are much less likely to think that. Um, I think the other thing that's been really interesting is the growth rate. People, you know, there's a, about a 60-point difference between Trump voters and Clinton voters on whether the growth rate is accelerating and increasing or whether it's decelerating and, and coming down. Um, and then the final one, and the one you just mentioned, is is the the death count. Um, there's, a, there's been some really interesting questions that have been asked in surveys, looking at whether people think the death count is underinflated, overinflated, or undercounted, overcounted, or about right with what the media is reporting. And there's about a 50 point difference between Republicans thinking it's under, or sorry, it's overcounted, and Democrats thinking it's undercounted. So it's it's really the partisanship has really impacted how people are processing this yeah. and it's certainly impacting behaviors uh willingness to wear a mask willingness to social distance willingness to those things there are big differences between folks of different political stripes and so um it's something that i think um you know every you know one of your clients and every health system should be looking at because everyone has republican patients democrat patients independent patients and while you know, you certainly don't want to make things partisan. I think understanding the psychology and, and what drives people and motivating factors is important and a big one right now. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon is partisanship. Yeah. It, and we've seen it, um, you know, we've seen it in places outside of healthcare that we've also seen images of protesters 
you know, kind of facing down healthcare workers, which is kind of astounding, right? The, the, the role that healthcare workers have played in this is the, the heroes. Um, and that you see some people that because that, that represents something that they're against, protesting those very people. That's weird. Um, we've obviously seen stories, though we don't know how widespread this is, but they're still striking when you hear them uh, of people that are um, that behave in a, in a horrible way if they're asked to wear a mask in a store, mm -hmm. right? So there's been enough of those. I don't need to, to quote them. Um, hospitals and health systems have to be ready for those things. They have to be ready for somebody who hears, well, because of our safety precautions, for example, social distancing in a waiting room, um, where we would normally be able to get you in for surgery in two weeks, it's going to be two months or whatever, right? A completely reasonable thing to say, whatever the numbers are, to have somebody react and say, well, that's, you're being overcautious. And I don't think that's really a threat. And I'm going to go down the street to somebody who will. Now, they may run into the same issue, likely, wherever they go. But um, that all the way to you know, potential public relations crises and things like that that could stem from some of this. Uh, unfortunately, it's a real thing. Um, and to your point, it's just, it just shows how people will see this pen. And depending on how you're looking and I'm looking at, I could be seeing a, a, a weapon and you could be seeing a, you know, a tool of great creativity. Yeah. Um, and it's the same darn thing. Yeah. And, and I think one final point to that, and I know you guys have covered this really well, and I know you, you've looked at this in all of your research, um, and I know you, you, you know, this is a, one of the big things that you guys have really stressed and, and been working on and been actively engaged in across the country, but that's just, you know, not to, to beat a dead horse, but to come back to the role that providers play in communicating, and they are above the fray. They're above the Fox News, the CNN, the M MSNBC, the New York Times, the Wall Street any of the ways that people look at and consume information that's sort of partisan, you know, and through a partisan lens, the, the one that's not the sort of the, the area that's, that has a wild sort of active role in this, which is healthcare providers are not viewed through partisan lens or maybe a fr very, very small percent, but for the most of the country, that's not viewed through the same sort of partisan lens. And I think that still sort of reinforces that need for providers to continue to be put, you know, pushing, information out into their communities through emails, texts, you know, paid media, earned media, whatever it might be. But I think it's clear in every single piece of research that I've seen and looked at over the last eight weeks that that's one area where people are not viewing through a partisan lens, which is, is healthcare providers. And so I think that continues to reinforce the need to, to communicate that, you know, that information out to the community. So the data that you're seeing, do you think healthcare providers are, are communicating enough? I don't, I'm not seeing it. I, I, there's a really good survey from University of Chicago a couple of weeks ago that asked who are the most trusted sources. And as you can right. guess, healthcare providers were at the very top of the list, ahead of CDC, ahead of Dr. Fauci, ahead of obviously federal government, President Trump, governor, et cetera. But then it asked, who are you hearing from the most or who are you receiving the most information from? And providers were at the very bottom of the list. So there's not, there, there's a disconnect and just a quick personal anecdote. I mean, my wife and I, our, our, our two-year-old, we have four physicians between us, two primary care physicians, an OB and a pediatrician. And we receive care from three major health systems in the, in the DC area. There are about seven in the DC area. Um, over the last two years, all of them have our contact information. We haven't heard from a single provider in the last eight weeks, not one of anyone that we've, we've received care from. So that tells me, you know, just in, it's an anecdotal example, but you know, it, between the public data and between things like that, it tells me that there needs to be some more provider communication because they are viewed above the fray from, from politics and partisanship. Yeah, and and some of that may be understandable while the, while the crisis was at its peak, though even then, as we advocated to that point, you need to be out there as a community leader, not just a healthcare leader, helping people figure this out. So they, you should have heard from somebody in that time too. But boy, is that ever more critical now as we're trying to come out of this and you're trying to reopen as a, a hospital and health system, retaining the people that had to have procedures put off, trying to attract new ones in. I mean, the financial need for that is just, you can't overstate it yeah. because of the hole that, that's been dug financially for these, these organizations. And so, I mean, Chase, you told that anecdotally like two weeks ago. I've said that. I mean, we know this is anecdotal, but um, 
it certainly reflects what we've seen systemically as well, yeah. that they're just, they're not, and, and there's probably some valid reasons for it, but those folks that can figure it out um, really have an opportunity to establish themselves even further um, as the place to turn. So this is, as always, we didn't get to half the stuff we want to talk about because <laughs> yeah, there's just so much good stuff, but I, I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it, like always. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll have you back. We were talking before the show um, about how long we were going to be doing this. You know, we, we commit to, to being there every day that our audience is dealing with this crisis. And uh, boy, we would like to think that as the summer comes in, that's going to be less and less. But uh, it may turn from a COVID crisis, or it will, to a kind of a financial crisis yeah. for these organizations. And so um, there will probably be ample opportunity to bring you back. So we will, we will look to do that. Look forward to that. And Chase, as always, thank you. Absolutely. Enjoyed the conversation today. Thanks, Jarrett. Thanks, Chase. Just a reminder, if you have something you want us to cover, you're not hearing us talk about it, let us know. Put it in the chat channel now um, or email me at cab at thinkrevivehealth.com. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a guest host, uh, our regular guest host. Is that can we say that? Is that redundant? Yeah, re he's a regular. At this Not point. redundant, oxymoronic. Um, Jeff Spear, who's going to be back. And we're actually going to be joined uh, by Catherine Harrell, who's CMO at Franciscan Missionary of Our Lady's Health System down in Baton Rouge. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Catherine about things they've learned and the things they've been doing. Um, and in fact, we're going to be having um, guest hosts for the next couple of weeks because I am taking a um, I don't know if sabbatical is two weeks. That's too short for sabbatical. <laughs> I'm taking short, time, yeah. <laughs> time away from the podcast, um, primarily because we're diving in um, with some of our clients really deeply on this rapid recovery work. And so um, I'm involved in that, but also taking some time off. So over the next couple of weeks, um, we'll have Jeff back. We'll have um, some other folks you've heard from, some people you haven't heard from. Um, so you can have a really nice variety of guest hosts, um, so please continue to join us for that. Uh, remember to visit our website, thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 for all the good things I mentioned before. Uh, and again, we will, we are continuing to be there for you. As long as you're dealing with this crisis, we're going to be here every day. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to be, but right now we have no intent of stopping uh, because the stuff you're doing is so important. Uh, as a marketing and communications professional in this field, we just want to be here to support you, bring you resources like Jarrett and the data he brings, um, advice, everything we can to help you because the work you're doing is so important to the patients you're serving, to the organizations you work for, to all of us as a whole in this country trying to move through this. So keep up the good work, hang in there. Thanks for joining us today and we will talk to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.